Welcome to the second part of this webcast lecture about Karl Marx, which is given in a series of 10 minute segments so that it's easier to use. Uh, I finished the previous segment by talking very briefly about Marx's thesis on Feuerbach, in which uh, he makes the famous remark that philosophers have interpreted the world in various ways, but the point is to change it. The criticism there was of the Jung Hegelians and the idea that there were um, natural forces at work in the world that would uh, achieve a perfect society. Uh, Marx rejects this. He takes from Hegel a, a kind of teleological view that that the human race is on a sort of journey from uh, barbarianism through certain stages of history. Those stages of history are the common anthropological stages that uh, an empiricist like Adam Smith also used, that there were known stages. There was barbarism and then slavery and feudalism and uh, to uh, liberalism. Uh, which Marx typifies capitalism. So there are all the, you know, history is a process. He takes that much from Hegel, but he doesn't agree with the young Hegelians that there's anything natural about this progress towards perfect society. And uh, people will have to actually get off their backsides, as it were, and make the necessary uh, changes to society in order to achieve this uh, utopia. So throughout his writings, Marx defines himself as a follower of Hegel, an admirer of Hegel, and his philosophical system, insofar as Marxism is philosophy, is almost entirely Hegelian. But he uses Hegel mainly in a negative way to criticise the mechanistic materialism, as he calls it, of the British empiricists and the British political economists. Now, what he means by mecha mechanistic materialism is what we've previously discussed as empiricism arising from the Enlightenment, the scientific method, the method in the physical sciences of Newton, and the idea that, that God is a clockmaker, that he created all this celestial clockwork, which uh, Newton believed he'd accurately described uh, in its laws of motion, uh, and which uh, the social sciences, the social scientists, the early social thinkers of empiricism, People like Locke and perhaps Hume had also attributed this material, this mechanistic approach to uh, society, to, to human behaviour as well. You can see this above all in the liberal philosophy of utilitarianism. People are rather like soulless machines. They respond to stimuli. Um, they're trying to avoid pain and maximise their utility or their happiness. Um, that's there as well, of course, in the economics of Adam Smith. People really are like these soulless, spiritless machines, which um, can be manipulated by, for example, the price mechanism, the hidden hand of the market, and so on. Karl Marx doesn't accept this this type of extreme materialism, this mechanistic materialism, this kind of non-spiritual way of looking at people. He describes it as bourgeois ideology, meaning a worldview that has been erected really to challenge feudal worldview of, um, uh, in the preface to Das Kapital, Karl Marx writes, quote, I am a disciple of Hegel and the presumptuous chattering classes who believe they have dismissed and buried this eminent thinker are ridiculous. The pure materialist or empiricist re um, rejection of philosophical idealism. Marx continues by saying, but I have taken the liberty of adopting a critical attitude towards my master. Hegel, to rid his dialectic of mysticism and thus to subject it to profound change. In place of this mechanistic materialism, Karl Marx advocates dialectical materialism, or at least Frederick Engels did. It's not clear that Marx himself ever used that term. Uh, and in subsequent years, the whole system of dialectical materialism has been criticised as a type of dogma that Marx himself never employed. The phrase Marx does use uh, quite a lot is the materialist conception of history, and this seems to do the same job, as it were, uh, as um, dialectical materialism in Marxist dogma. Marx, by the way, famously said, I am not a Marxist. This was in the last uh, decades of his life when some of his ideas were beginning to be adopted by socialist political parties uh, around Europe. He didn't like the, the kind of fossilization of some of his views, um, such as the promulgation of this idea of dialectical materialism. Nevertheless, if we draw a line between the empiricist and, the empiricist and materialists on the one hand and the religious thinkers and idealists on the other, it's very clear that Marx is on the materialist side of that divide. Uh, but he's differentiating himself from what he calls the crude materialists, such as uh, John Locke, for example by bringing back in a historical context to their 
laws of um, universal human rights and so on. So in the thesis on Feuerbach, um, Karl Marx says that uh, human personality, for example, is not just the result of social circumstances. People are not the tabula rasa, the blank slate on which the world writes, uh, as in the philosophical system of John Locke and also in the outlook of David Hume. Uh, Marx says that the materialist doctrine concerning changing circumstances and upbringing in shaping personality forgets that circumstances are made by men and that the educator himself must be educated. And the same would be true of doctrines of universal rights. The question would arise, well, who says? I mean, who, who is determining these rights? And uh, the act of promulgating universal individual rights, the right to property, for example, the right to personal individual property, is not a universal law. Um, it's part of historical development in Hegelian terms. And again, Marx says, the question whether objective truth can be attributed to human thinking is not a question of is not a question of theory, but a practical question. So once again, truth arises, knowledge arises from interaction with the world, and political ideas therefore arise uh, as a result of political struggle, of a conflict or a war, or a political political ba battle of some sort. Ideas don't just come out of anywhere as in idealism, uh, but at the same time it is possible for people to have transcendent ideas, which is really impossible in the strictly me mechanistic materialist view of human nature promulgated by a person such as Adam Smith. So Marx takes from Hegel the idea of perpetual change, of dialectical change, and his analysis is always historical, that uh, if you're looking at claims to universal rights, you've got to look at where they came from, historically. And the key to this, he says famously in the Communist Manifesto, is that the history of all hitherto existing societies is the history of class struggle. The key to history is not, as Hegel thought, um, the contention between abstract principles of good and evil all the time, uh, resulting in the synthesis uh, on earth as such entities of the Prussian state, the Prussian state was the result of the eternal struggle between good and evil, that uh, Karl Marx changes that entirely. He says uh, he stands Hegel on his feet. He's sometimes misquoted as saying he stands Hegel on his head, although I think that misquote is very helpful. It's very indicative. So he's taking the Hegelian dialectical system of uh, s starting point, that's the thesis, its opposite, the antithesis, and the struggle between those two things, the synthesis, as the way in which change happens in the world. But that's not between abstract principles. It's between real contending groups of people with different desires, different objectives, different needs. And these real groups in history, Marx describes as the classes. So we've reached the key idea for Marx of class and class struggle. Uh, and so that's a good point at which to break off and end part two of this webcast lecture about Karl Marx.